bless you and thank you for joining us on this very important introductory course. Uh, we're going to start with Hidden Treasure Beyond the Veil. That's the name of volume one of our glorious inheritance, an eight volume book series that explores this revelation of over 1,000 names and titles that belong to the children of God. Now, each one of those books uh, covers about 100 to 200 names given to us, and each one has a sub-theme. The sub-theme of volume one is the subtitle, Hidden Treasure Beyond the Veil. And that's why we have titled this volume one course, Hidden Treasure Beyond the Veil. Because this revelation of who we are in Christ is a treasure. It's going to enrich you, but you have to go past the veil of flesh consciousness. The normal confining boundaries that most human beings function within. You've got to go into the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and find out what your spiritual identity is. So let's go beyond the veil. At the head of the page, it says, a study of the volume one introductory theme that depicts the revelation of the titles of the children of God as treasure hidden beyond the veil of flesh consciousness in every child of God. Now, before we start into the outline, let me give you some beginning information that's very important. Back around 1983, 1984, I was traveling as an evangelist. I was preaching relevant truth. I believe I was helping and edifying the body of Christ and winning many into the kingdom. But I became desperate in my spirit to get a fresh revelation. What I was preaching sounded like an echo of what almost everyone else I knew was preaching. And I wanted something fresh from heaven, not outlandish, not outrageous, but something that would be an extravagant outpouring of insight from God that was relevant and powerful for the body of Christ. Well, at the time, I was studying a very popular subject, the names and titles of God, and how edified I was because as I studied his names and his titles, the veil was pulled back on who God is, and tremendous confidence was built in me in my relationship with him because I knew if he named himself certain ways, I could expect a manifestation of that in my life, and we'll go into that more deeply in a few moments. Well, while I was studying that, God began to speak to me that it would be just as important for you and I to know our God-given names, that just like the names and titles of God pull back the veil on who he is, the names and titles of the children of God would pull back the veil on who we are. Excitedly, I started into that quest in the word of God, thinking I might find 30 or 40, 50, at the very most, 100 entitlements that belong to us. Much to my surprise, I discovered over a period of 10, 15 years of studying this subject, over 1,000 names and titles that belong to the people of God. Like a chosen gener generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, the apple of his eye, ambassadors for Christ, the anointed of the Lord, children of the resurrection, children of light, the salt of the earth, and the list goes on and on and on. This is going to get powerful. This is going to get exciting. I'm sure you're going to be blessed because this course is going to revolutionize your life. I just guarantee it. And God wants you to discover who you are, not just so that you can store it up in your mind, but so that you can have a transformation, not just information, but a transformation is very powerful, and it's a potential when we learn this lesson. So we go from information to revelation to transformation. Let it happen, Lord. Now let's go to the outline, and you should receive your outline by going to the website, shreveministries.org, look under school, and right there in the course uh, uh, catalog, you click on the course that you're taking and your outlines are available to you there. The importance of knowing our names and titles. The definition of a name. 
Now, a name is a word or a phrase that constitutes the distinctive designation of a person or a thing. When you hear the name of something, you associate a lot of things with it. If I were to say the name of the present president of the United States of America, you would associate many things with that name. It's the distinctive designation of a person, place, or thing. Now, names are more personal than titles. Titles tend to show an office or a position of authority. The description here is a title is a descriptive name that indicates rank, office, or privilege and is usually given as a gesture or mark of respect, recognition, and honor. And so God gives us both names and titles. And these names and titles indicate how he feels toward us. Some of them are challenges to character development, like those found in the Beatitudes, the poor in spirit, the meek, um, the pure in heart, peacemakers, all of those are challenges to character development. While others show the power and the authority of our position, for instance, we are referred to as children of the covenant. And that's a revelation of the power of living in a covenant relationship with God. Or we're called children of the prophets. We are the product of the prophetic word that's gone forth in the past. And that just shows the importance of who we are. Oracles of God, that's a revelation of the power we have when we speak in his name. Or the household of faith, the dominant characteristic of Christians should be our ability to believe. So every name has its own flavor and reveals its own unique uh, insight into who we are in Christ. Now, when you know a person's title, you know a lot about that person's level of influence and level of affluence. If you know someone is doctor so-and-so and you recognize that as a medical doctor, normally, at least in our culture, in our society here in the Western world, that uh, gives you insight into that person's position of influence and affluence. And uh, of course, is given to him as a recognition of the education that was necessary to achieve that position. So it's very important to know a person's titles. It's very important to know the titles given to God. Let me go over a few. Let's start with the names given to God. Some of the divine names that I could include here are the names uh, that the name that uh, Abraham used in reference to God. God revealed himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, which means the almighty God. And that word almighty means all powerful and all sufficient. One person interprets El Shaddai to mean the God who is more than enough. How faith building is that to understand that particular name given to the Most High? He's also referred to in scripture as Yahweh Ira or Jehovah Jireh is uh, the traditional rendering, but Yahweh Ira means the Lord our provider, which was actually the name of the place where Isaac was uh, presented as a sacrifice to God and God provided a substitute for him in death. And so it speaks the message that no matter what our need is, uh, even all the way up to a substitute in death, God will provide. He named himself that way. He's going to back it up with a performance. Other names given to God are like, I am that I am, the revelation of the name given to Moses at the burning bush. In fact, God told Moses, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he said, this is my memorial forever. And I believe God naming himself with the names of those he was in covenant relationship with was God's way of showing the importance of people that he unites with himself and that he's willing to uh, celebrate them as being his representatives in this world. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What a powerful way for God to name himself. What a revelatory way for God to name himself because that's his way of saying you're important. Not only is Abraham and Isaac and Jacob important, but every one of you, the God of Michael, 
the God of James, the God of Peter, or whoever it may be, walking with God. Praise God. He's also referred to in Scripture in Jeremiah 23, verse 6, as Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness, which is an incredible revelation that we could never attain to a high enough standard of righteousness to earn eternal life, but God himself transfers to us the gift of righteousness. He is Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. How powerful is that? And when the Lord Jesus was born, his name, of course, in the Hebrew was Yeshua, and his title, Mashiach. Jesus, what we would use in our culture, Christ. But Christ comes from the Greek Christos. And so originally in the Hebrew, it would be more correctly Yeshua Mashiach. And Yeshua means the salvation of God. When he was just a little baby in Mary's arms, that was the salvation of God contained in the form of an infant. How powerful is that? And every time she called his name, it was a declaration that God's salvation had come into the world. Though it was not yet known, though he was not yet revealed, his name revealed his destiny and his purpose. And so it is with you. So it is with you. Because actually in scripture, you're referred to as the anointed of the Lord also. And that word anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach. And so you are the Mashiach of the Lord, of Yahweh. That gives you a status of responsibility and a status of authority in this world that is mind-boggling. You are the anointed of the Lord, and on your life, the lives of many other people are hinged because your faithfulness to your calling, your faithfulness to your purpose makes you a channel of the anointing to others so that the yoke can be destroyed in their lives. You are important to God's plan. Now, can you see how divine names and titles pull back the veil on who he is? Some of his titles, let me share a few, are titles like the author and the finisher of our faith, which reveals to me that any faith I have in him came as a work of God to begin with, and he will continue that work to the very end. He's not going to give up on me halfway through. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. In the book of Revelation, he celebrates himself as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Praise God. That's his way of saying, I, I started the creation. I will bring it to completion. And no matter how disastrous things may get in this world, the God who started it will complete it. He titles himself that way. And these titles are revelations of who he is. I list a few here in your outline in Deuteronomy 32, 15. He's called the rock of our salvation. Solid, sure, stable, dependable. 1 Samuel 15, 29, he's called the strength of Israel. And I am sure you would admit with me that you have insufficient strength within yourself to contend with the battles of life. But you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because the Messiah, Mashiach, is the strength of Israel. He's the strength of his people. In John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. Now, here's a curious thing. He said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But he also, in the Sermon on the Mount, spoke to his disciples and said, you are the light of the world. So he filled that position when he was here on earth, walking in a place of great darkness. But then when he vacated that position to ascend back up to heaven, he said, you occupy till I come. You occupy the position I filled as the only begotten Son of God, he ascended to heaven so that he could send the Spirit so that he could beget thousands upon thousands of sons and daughters that would shed forth his light globally. And so if it was a heavy weight of responsibility on him to enlighten a world that was engulfed in darkness, it's a heavy weight of responsibility on us as well. It's our name. It's our identity. It's our calling. It's our destiny. He's referred to in Isaiah 28, 16 as a sure foundation. A sure 
foundation. No other foundation can be laid except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. No other religion is sufficient. No other religious leader can do for you what he did because he was God in a human body. He was the son of man, yet the son of God. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, a sure foundation for you to build your life on. However, you and I are also referred to as a foundation. The Bible said the righteous is an everlasting foundation because people are building their hopes on your faith walk too, that if it works for you, it can work for them. And the foundations of New Jerusalem have the names inscribed in them of the 12 apostles of the Lamb because they became a foundation of the church. So can you see how the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in his names and titles is also being transferred to you because you're taking on his image from glory to glory, the Bible says. Next, in John 1, he's referred to as the Lamb of God. Behold! the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You wouldn't expect that of God Almighty in a human body. You'd expect forceful titles, not something tender and gentle and harmless and unable to retaliate like a lamb. And yet that was the enigma. That was the mystery of the incarnation that he came into the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own, for the most part, did not receive him. And yet he didn't react with anger. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Behold, the Lamb of God. But see, it's not just Jesus who bears that title, because he also said concerning his covenant people that he bears his lambs in his bosom. He carries them in his arms. So not only is he called to a lamb-like nature, you and I are called to a lamb-like nature. And these are just a sampling of hundreds and hundreds of names and titles that rest upon the firstborn son, hundreds and hundreds of names and titles that rest upon all the other sons and daughters of God. No wonder Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it. Listen, there's no time to drag your feet now. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Two things that that passage speaks to me. First of all, you better hasten to get this revelation deep in your spirit because you're under attack. Every Christian, every child of God is contending with the devil and all his hosts of demons and a world system that is pitted against the truth. You need a place of refuge and security. So God said, discover this revelation of the name of the Lord, then run into it because if you know who he is, you can have faith in what he will do in your behalf. Run into the name of the Lord and be safe there. But there's another hidden revelation that I need to bring out about that passage because a tower is made of multiple blocks, one resting on top of the other until the entirety of the tower is built and so one tower is made up of multiple parts. And when you say the name of the Lord, it's not just one singular name like Yeshua. That's one of many. Just like my name is a name made up of many names. I have actually four names, Michael, Richard, Christopher, Shreve. I received the name Christopher as a Catholic. I was raised in the Catholic Church. I met a lot of wonderful, humble, kind meek people in the Catholic Church. Now I'm interdenominational. I've been born again. There's multiplied millions of Catholics, Baptists, Methodists worldwide that have been born again, and we're all realizing it's not so much what denomination you belong to, it's who you belong to that is important. And I count myself one with all the body of Christ, regardless of their denominational affiliation, if they've truly been born again. But back to the issue. I have four names, Michael, Richard, Christopher, Shreve, and that, those four names make up my singular name. What is your name? Michael, Richard, Christopher, Shreve. These four are one. Well, when you say the name of the Lord, you're talking about all of his names. You're talking about all of those I've mentioned and much more. He is Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. He is Yahweh Rea, the Lord our shepherd, Yahweh uh, Rapha, the Lord, our healer, 
all of his names, one block building on top of the other until you get the complete revelation of all his names and all his titles. Run into it. So it's a place of safety in a time of attack, in a time of war, a time of conflict. But then we see it from another angle too. Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 3. The bride of the Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful book incidentally. It's, it's a rapturous conversation between a prospective bridegroom and bride. And, and his complimentary exchanges between the two and is so full of revelation because it's all about the real shepherd king bridegroom who is the Lord Jesus Christ, represented by Solomon in the Song of Solomon, which means peace. Solomon means peace or peaceable or uh, peaceful. And uh, the Shulamite bride, and incidentally, Shulamite is the feminine of Solomon, and it means peace, peaceful, or peaceable. And so the shepherd king bridegroom adores his bride-to-be, the Shulamite. And she says this. She says, because of the fragrance of thy good ointments, because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. An ointment was used for um, cosmetic purposes, uh, and it was used for cleansing. And when she says that your name is as ointment poured forth, it's like the most beautiful, fragrant oil being poured over you when you call on his blessed, blessed name. Now that speaks of intimacy. That's not warfare. That's not a place of security from an enemy. That's a place of intimacy with God. So the name of the Lord does both. Knowing our God-given names and titles is very important, but all the more we realize its importance when we see how powerfully God used names, especially in the Old Testament and also in the New. And I list a few key figures in Scripture where the name of that person was a revelation of that person's destiny, calling, and purpose in life. It was a prophetic proclamation of what God would do in and through that person. For instance, the name Noah means rest. Now surely when his parents gave him that name, they had no idea that he would provide an ark of rest in the midst of great, tumultuous uh, days, a, a, a year of floodwaters being on the earth and the entire human race being destroyed. But in the midst of it all, there's an ark of rest. And the one who built the ark and maintained uh, the animals in the ark during that time, his very name meant rest. And I believe he was also a type of the Father God himself who is our rest, and Christ is our rest. The Messiah is our place of rest. And he's building an ark spiritually that we, can, uh, that we can run to in very tumultuous times we're living in as well. I'll list some more here in your outline. For instance, Abraham's name means father of a multitude. Well, originally his name was Abram, which means exalted father or father of height exalted father. But then when God revealed himself to this man and said, get out from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house, and I'll make of you a great nation. Eventually, as God revealed his purpose and destiny, he said, uh, your name shall no more be called Abram, but Abraham, for a father of many nations, have I made you. I call that the past prophetic tense. It had not yet happened. But God spoke of it in the past tense as if it had already taken place. God calls those things that are not as though they were. And the very naming of Abram with the new name, Abraham, which means father of a multitude, was a prophetic proclamation that even though he eventually at the age of 99 and Sarah at the age of 90, Though his body was dead, her body was dead, non-productive is really what it meant. Impossible to conceive, impossible to beget. God quickened their bodies and did what he had said years ago he would do. 
And every time somebody called him Abraham or every time God called him Abraham, it was reinforcing the prophecy. Praise God. Some say that the name Israel, which was a name that was given to Jacob the night he wrestled with the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a term for the pre-incarnate Christ, the pre-incarnate Messiah. And he wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long and then... The angel said, let me go, the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said, your name shall no more be called Jacob, which means supplanter, but Israel shall your name be. And Israel, some say, there's some controversy over the meaning of the name, but some say it could be interpreted as prince of God or one who rules and reigns with God. How powerful is that? No wonder Israel, though opposed by many enemies, has survived again and again. Its very name means it reigns with God. It reigns with God. Now, there's a number. Uh, oh, one more I want to bring out is the name Jesus gave Simon. He called him Peter, which means a rock. And that was the Lord's way of saying that even though he showed some instability, he cursed and said, I don't even know the man. He gave him that name because it was God's way of saying, you're going to be a rock. You're going to be solid. You're going to be dependable. I'm going to base my hope for the building of a new covenant church on you and the rest of my disciples. Praise God. Now, there are a number of meaningful God-given personal names that belong to us. Not just titles. We have many, many titles like heirs of God and joining us with Christ and children of the resurrection. Those are entitlements. But we have some personal names that have been given to us corporately as the bride of Christ. And I list them here. In Hosea's writings, we are referred to as Ami, Ruhema, and Jezreel. Ami means my people. Ruhema means having obtained mercy. And Jezreel means the seed of God sown in the earth. Well, the progression of those names is itself a revelation of who we are. First, we were a, a people who were no people. We were not the people of God. We were bound in darkness. We were under the dominion of Satan and his evil minions. But then we wrenched free when we believed in the cross and God said, you're am I now. You're my people. How could I ever become one of God's people? You're Ruhema. You've obtained mercy. Well, now that I'm a part of this wonderful body of believers that have obtained the mercy of God, what do I do? You're Jezreel. You're the seed of God sown in the earth. Bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Bring forth the truth and offer it to others. You're the seed of God sown in the earth. And kingdom life is within your heart that needs to be perpetuated in this world and advanced in this world. You are Jezreel. Get about the business of being who you're called to be. Now, understanding who we are comes not only by study, but more importantly, it comes by divine revelation. Because you're never going to really understand who you are intellectually. It's got to be revelationally. And, uh, and this is a powerful thought. Go with me. I've got it listed in your outline to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's a title that rests on the Holy Spirit. He is referred to as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's who he is. That's what he does. All right? The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. This is Paul praying for the Ephesians, but more than that, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, praying for the entire church. Because when he wrote this epistle, the Holy Spirit moves on holy men of God, and they write as they're inspired. The word inspired means to breathe into. The Holy Spirit breathed this prayer into Paul, and he wrote it down, communicated it, to the Ephesians, but it didn't stop there. This prayer was intended by the Holy Spirit for the entire church, and you ought to just lift up your hand right now and say, I receive this prayer. I receive it by faith because the Holy Spirit has interceded this over me. The Bible said when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit makes intercession for us, so 
Not only is Jesus the great intercessor, who ever lives to make intercession for us, the great high priest, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession to the Father for us. How amazing is that? You've got the Son of God and the Holy Spirit both interceding in your behalf. And the Bible said, if any two agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done. The Son of God has never prayed where the Father did not answer. The Holy Spirit has never prayed where the Father did not answer. So you're talking about a track record of total success in prayer. And they're agreeing together over you. You've got it made. You better look on this prayer as if it was prayed personally for you. Now let me go through it again. Paul says to the Ephesians that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you. Everybody say, I receive it. <laughs> I receive it right now that he may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Thank you for it, Lord. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I need that, I want that, and I accept that. That you may know the hope of your calling. Thank you, I receive that too, Lord. And the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the greatness of his power to them that believe it goes on to say. I receive all of that. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10 says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. See, God doesn't just want religious people. I'm up to here with religion. I've been through so much religious damage that I'm down to basics. And the basics are love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Love others. And if love's not in it, I don't want to be in it. And right here it says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's the crux of the matter. God just wants lovers of God to emerge in this hate-filled world. But don't tell me that you cannot understand the things of God. Well, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man. Go to the next line. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Holy Spirit, I'm open. I'm open. I want to know more. I hunger. I thirst for more. Show me the deep things of God. Solomon in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, talks about wisdom. And he says, wisdom is the principal thing. In all you're getting, get wisdom. And then he goes on to promise, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Well, I just gave you a scripture that says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And when the Holy Spirit influences the heart of a true lover of God, you're going to come into a revelation of wisdom. You're going to find out who you really are. You're going to have the eyes of your understanding enlightened. You're going to know the hope of your calling, the greatness of his power toward those who believe. No wonder you get a crown of glory. A crown speaks of authority and dominion and power. A crown is an item placed on the brow of a king that is an emblem of the respect that is due to that person, the reverence, the submission the authority that rests upon that person. Of course, we don't want reverence or submission from people, but I do want submission from the demonic forces that are clouding the atmosphere of this world. And if you and I have been crowned with the revelation of who we are, then we can say, submit to what I say, you devil. You demon, come out of this person. Come out of that person. Get out of my life. You have no right to trespass on territory that I have relinquished to God's authority. Oh, I love the next scripture. Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Why? Because if God let everybody know everything about him and about the universe, it would be cheap. People would take it for granted. They would walk over top of truth like Isaiah talked about. He said, truth is fallen in the street. It's trampled underfoot. That's the nature of people. If it comes too easy, it's not appreciated. And so it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. God withholds a lot of information and encapsulates it in something called the mystery of the gospel. It is the glory of God 
to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings, the right of kings, is to search out a matter. And so if you've been crowned with wisdom, then your God-given right is to dig into the deep things of God. And that's what we're going to do in this course on our glorious narratives, the revelation of the names and titles of the children of God. We're digging for hidden treasure. In fact, in fact, we're going to see in the next few minutes that there's a lot of hidden things we're going to discover. Hidden manna, hidden treasure, and hidden glory. This revelation of the names and titles of the children of God in the opening introduction to this revelation are depicted in these three ways, uh, symbolized as hidden manna, hidden treasure, and hidden glory. First, let me say Hosea 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Start thinking about some of your friends that once went to church, that bit the dust, that has some kind of crash landing spiritually and haven't recovered yet. Don't you think they would have been able to go through that hard place and recover more victoriously if they had just known who they are? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, hopefully the opposite will be true with you. Because of this impartation of knowledge, you're going to become somewhat indestructible as long as God is on your side. If God be for us, who can be against us? No matter how many times you get knocked down in life, you'll know that you can get back up again. You're a vessel of mercy, and God's, ves God's vessels of mercy per uh, persist no matter what they go through. There's... Abundant mercy. We're in covenant. He's the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him to a thousand generations. Mercy, a reservoir of mercy, is always there for your recovery. That doesn't mean you take advantage of it, but it does mean you don't stay down if you do fall down. See, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but then the opposite is true. They are, they are strong and protected and kept and preserved because of the knowledge that God grants them through his word. Now let's go into those three categories for a few minutes, depicting this revelation of the names and titles of the children of God as hidden manna, hidden treasure, and hidden glory. Let's talk about the manna first. And where did I get this term hidden manna? It's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It's a message to one of the churches, the seven churches that are addressed in the beginning of the book of the Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says in a promise to this church, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Now there's a mystery there because the manna was not hidden. It was easily viewed. Anyone could go outside the camp of Israel. It was laying on the ground. In fact, uh, they overlooked it to begin with because it did not look like they thought it would look. I'm sure they were used to bread being baked a certain way and they thought the bread would fall from heaven in a similar fashion, a similar look, a similar taste. And instead it looked like frost laying on the ground and they walked around on top of it saying, where's the manna you told us about Moses? Or where's the bread rather that you told us about? And he scooped it up. And it was white, and it was about the size of a coriander seed. And it looked like the frost. Uh, and uh, they tasted it, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. And all of this was revelatory of the nature of it. And they called it manna, which humorously means, what is it? It didn't look like bread. Sometimes the thing God does in your life just does not look like what you preview in your mind. You get it all worked out in your mind. That's why the Bible said lean not on your own understanding because you're going to try and figure it out and you're going to expect something to come in a certain form or fashion or way and then God will do it totally opposite and you're going to get completely confused. So why don't you just go ahead and receive it the way God sends it? Manna. I can imagine those men with an omer full of manna uh, uh, going home, an omer of manna in a big basket going home. And the wife meets him at the door and says, what is it? And he says, that's what it is. Because manna means, what is it? And you know how kids are. The mother sets that bread from heaven down 
before them to eat. And, Ew, gross, what is it? Well, that's what it is. It's manna. It was a mystery. Well, what about this hidden manna? Because if even children could see the manna and they could walk outside the camp and it's laying on the ground and anybody could view it, what manna was hidden manna? There was only one small portion of manna that was hidden. It was that manna that was placed by Moses and Aaron in a golden bowl and set inside of the Ark of the Covenant, unlike the other manna that only lasted a night and then it was gone in the morning. Uh, this manna lasted, for all I know, until this very day. It was inundated or saturated with an everlasting kind of life. It was hidden in the Holy of Holies, and so no one could see it. It was inside of the ark. It was completely hidden away. No one would have dared gone in the Holy of Holies, and if they did, they surely would not dare open the, opening the lid of the ark. They knew that was unacceptable. But God is saying, if you overcome, overcome what? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the entanglements of this world, the compromise that comes to you daily, the allurement drawing you into a, a lifestyle of insensitivity to the things of God. If you overcome all of that and more, God said, I've got revelation for you that is deeper than surface revelation because all the manna was laying on the surface of the ground. It was all laying on the surface of the ground. And see, anyone could see it. Anyone could see it. Anyone could view it. But this was hidden away in the Holy of Holies. And so God is saying, you've got to become a person of holiness. See, you're a tabernacle. Just like that was a tabernacle. You have the outer court of your flesh, the holy place of your soul, and the Holy of Holies of your regenerated spirit. And God is saying, deep inside your heart of hearts, the mind of Christ is there. The revelation of the ages is there. Insight into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is there, but you've got to overcome the lethargic flesh that wants to be lazy with this Christianity and go after God passionately, and you'll know some things that most Christians don't comprehend because God takes you into that deeper, deeper understanding. I hope you hear this. Now, the word of God is represented as manna. It's, representa it's a representation of both the written word and the living word of God. Because the word of God is as sweet as honey. The word of God, just like the manna was as sweet as honey, the word of God is sweet to my taste. It's pure, just like the whiteness of the manna. It's a seed, just like the manna looked like a seed. The word of God is seed. You plant it in your life and it grows into something great. Everything about the manna was a revelation of the word of God. In fact, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 6, a very powerful passage, he said, I am the true bread from heaven. And so he was the word made flesh. And just like the manna came down from heaven to sustain them in the wilderness, when we receive Jesus, the real manna from heaven, the true bread from heaven, he sustains us in a wilderness world. And so it's a revelation of him, the embodiment of the word of God. And God gives us his manna-like word to reveal five things. I want you to get this in your spirit. When you eat this manna, this hidden manna, God wants you to discover who he is, who we are, what he will do for us, what we are called to do for him, and what our destiny is together. Get ready for hidden manna. Hallelujah. The next is hidden treasure. Hidden treasure. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, gave seven, actually eight, uh, if you count the concluding images that he shared in that chapter, eight parables of the kingdom of heaven. Eight mysteries are unveiled. And he said to his disciples, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Speaking of common, ordinary people that are not interested in the things of God. To them it's not given, but to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You should shout, you should rejoice that you've been made to be a recipient of the gift of revelation. 
How powerful is that? One of those parables goes like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. Later on, he goes on to explain that the field is the world. And the one who discovers that treasure goes and buy, sells all that he has in order to buy that treasure. Well, in like manner, the, uh, you and I have discovered Jesus to be a treasure. He's a treasure. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 3, that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The day I knelt down in a Volkswagen van on the side of the road in Tampa, Florida, I was hitchhiking. A man picked me up hitchhiking. I got in the van. I looked in. There was a picture of Jesus on the ceiling of the van. I knew it was the answer to my prayer. I had been praying all day long. Jesus, if you're truly the answer, if you're the savior of the world, show me today. And so this was a direct answer. A few minutes later, the man invited me to pray with him. I knelt down on my knees. I said, Jesus, come into my heart. And I found the treasure. I found something that enriched me beyond my wildest expectations, so much so that I gave up everything I was doing. I went and bought the field so I could get the treasure. I gave up everything. I was teaching yoga and meditation at four universities. I was running a yoga ashram. I had about 300 students who considered me their guru. And then when I found out Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to God but by him, I was quick and ready to pay the price so I could have that treasure. And the price was giving up all the false religious ideas I had and that I was promoting. That was my source of income. I let it all go because the treasure meant more to me. And that's what he's talking about here. But see, he was hidden from me for many years. And Isaiah 45, verse 15 says, watch this, truly or verily, you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Uh, with a smile, tongue in cheek, reason I said, you know what God's favorite game is? Hide and seek, because he hides himself, and then he says, seek me and you shall live. But see, he does that so that only those that are truly hungry, truly thirsty, have that encounter. They fulfill that quest of the soul. Now, let me show you how first Jesus was a treasure uh, that you discovered and deposited in your heart. Now, I list a number of scriptures here. In Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 5, the writer of Proverbs said, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And so you've got to understand wisdom is like a hidden treasure. Deuteronomy 28, 12 is a part of the 13 verses at the beginning of Deuteronomy 28 that are the proclamations of blessing on the obedient. And one of them is the Lord will open to you his good treasure. He will open to you his good treasure. So first we discover this treasure that is embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the treasure that was in him is transferred to us. And I've got some great scriptures that share that. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 but we have this treasure. This is a comforting scripture to me. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of man. He gets all the glory. Like David, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. God put this treasure in an earthen vessel subject to confusions and fears and doubts and depression and discouragement and enticements and temptations and a war going on around all of us. We wonder how could God love us? God puts a treasure in earthen vessels that he might get all the glory. Proverbs 15, 6 says, In the house of the righteous, there is much treasure. So not only in your home, physically speaking, but in the house that you dwell in, your body is a house that your soul abides within. There's much treasure in there. Now let me show you what happens. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus said, well, he also said, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. So first, you've got to find where your treasure is 
Focus your heart on it. And then he said, a good man or a good woman out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. In other words, first you find the treasure hidden in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Then that treasure is deposited in you. And then the goal of your life is to bring forth that good treasure and enrich others. I hope that happens as a result of this course. Next, hidden glory. And we're coming to a close now. The glory of God resided among God's people in the days of Moses in the tabernacle. The tabernacle in the wilderness. It didn't look very glorious from the outside. It was covered with badger skin, sun bleached, sun burnt, dirty looking badger skins. Well, I think there's a number of reasons why God chose to dwell in such an unimpressive place. It wasn't some building that was ornately designed on the outside. There was spectacular beauty on the inside, but from the outside, it just looked somewhat common. Why would God do that? Because God has more humility than some people. And uh, he wanted to display himself, not in an extravagant, boastful way, but a very humble and lowly way. And besides, a badger is an unbelievably tenacious, fierce little animal that will fight animals 20 times its size with no fear. And so maybe that was God's way of saying he's not afraid of any of the resistance or the, uh, the rejection that he'll receive in this world. I don't know what his thinking was, but I do know from the outside the tabernacle did not look all that impressive. And didn't Isaiah say in chapter 53 that, uh, that Jesus would not look all that impressive? In verse 2 he said, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, and he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he wasn't a flashy kind of person. But I believe he emanated strength in the features of his face. And seriousness and holiness and goodness and love. But not some kind of flashy handsomeness. So the glory was hidden from view. Even the priests couldn't see it. Only one, the high priest, could go in one time a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and dare to walk in the Holy of Holies with goat blood to sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Incidentally, the mercy seat was the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. The law, the Torah, with all of its 613 commandments, was underneath, inside the Ark. The law by itself would condemn the human race, but there was something just a little higher than the law. Thank God, thank God, thank God. And that was the mercy seat because God's mercy is something higher than his strict rules and regulations. And that was God's way of saying, you come to him, you come to a throne of mercy and he'll bend for the repentant. He'll bend for those who humble themselves in true remorse. But see, the glory was hidden from view and a common ordinary Israelite never dreamed of being able to go into the Holy of Holies to view the Shekinah. The Shekinah is not a biblical word. Shekinah is a traditional word that means the one who dwells. S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H. Shekinah, glory. Because God Shekinah has always been looking for a dwelling place. But now the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, that because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of how he came out of the grave, because of conquering death, hell, and the grave, the power of sin, the curse of Adam, the curse of the law, all the arch enemies of the human race, he conquered them all. Because of that, it says, therefore, I love the word therefore, it means the conclusion has been reached. And I often tell people when I find the word therefore, I want to find out what it's there for. And it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So now it's not parting the veil that was made of blue and scarlet and purple. It's going through the outer part of who Jesus was, no form nor comeliness, and going into the inner sanctum of who he really was. 
not just the lowly Nazarene, but the creator of the universe. Go in and you'll find out there's spectacular beauty inside, just like there was a golden Ark of the Covenant and golden table of showbread and golden menorah and a golden uh, uh, table of incense, altar of incense. And the light in that place was not sunlight, it was heaven's light because the fire on the menorah was lit from the altar and the fire on the altar came from heaven. So that was no ordinary place. That was beautiful beyond description. And when you come into the hidden glory of God in your life, you may look common to people on the outside, but there's beauty beyond description on the inside. Now, the veil of the tabernacle represents the veil of flesh consciousness that covers the whole human race. And I've got great news for you. There's a fantastic prophecy that we need to conclude with. God is speaking of the kingdom age yet to come, the era when the Lord Jesus Christ will reign as king of kings right here in this world, and you'll reign with him. That's your ultimate goal. Your ultimate goal is not heaven. Your ultimate goal is reigning on the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that's referred to as the mountain of the Lord that will spread throughout all the world. And he says in Isaiah 25, verse 7, that he will destroy in this mountain, he will destroy in this mountain the surface of the covering that is cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. That is the veil of the insensitive nature, the carnal nature that is locked inside of what a man can see, what a man can hear, what a man can taste, what a man can touch, what a man can smell. Five senses become a prison enclosing the whole human race and they're usually motivated by the gratification of fleshly desires that are all bodily and physical. That's a veil spread over all nations. But in the kingdom to come, that veil will be lifted and we'll find out who we really are in God's great economy, what his plans are in this great destiny ahead of us. But see, the Bible said in Christ, that veil is removed right now. We don't have to wait for the kingdom age to come. We can go into him right now. And finally, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, speaking of the hope that we have for the destiny of who we are. God has referred to us as the church, the bride of Christ, the redeemed of the Lord, stewards of the mysteries of God. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's like this huge anchor which enters into the presence beyond the veil. It's like we take this anchor of hope and we cast it beyond the veil that encloses the whole human race and it lodges in the cleft of the rock. We cast this anchor of hope beyond the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is fantastic. This is really fantastic. 